Good morning and happy Father's Day, Marian Methodist. Glad that you've joined us here, live in the sanctuary or in the church online. Um, I'm a pastor that's never really been afraid of trying something different. So over this series, the next seven weeks or so, we're going to have a little piece in our worship uh, time called the Introduction to the Scripture, where one of us that's not preaching that day will share a little insight to what the Scripture you're about to hear and what the sermon uh, you're about to uh, drink in will be about. Before that, let me give you context. I'm not with you this morning uh, for the second out of three weeks, and I apologize for that. Uh, eight months ago, one of my friends uh, asked me if I would come and speak on this particular Sunday at his church in all four of their services at Geneseo, Illinois. He was going on refreshment leave, and so I really didn't want to back out. This was, of course, behind or before uh, those folks in our congregation, our, our staff uh, discerned that they needed to go somewhere else, so I didn't want to back out. So I'm there, but trust me, I've brought in a ringer to speak with you today. The scriptures this morning come from Mark chapter 9 and Mark chapter 10, and they both have to do with the young or the immature in the faith persons. One of them is the story where Jesus uh, famously is receiving the children and says, let the children come unto me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And you can see if you drive up to our church, the very nature of the real estate that we have here is people can understand that training the young is important. We have a whole wing, a third of our building is centered around bringing the young of the faith or the novice in the faith into a deeper and richer faith. So, so learning is important in the Christian faith and parents find it important to bring their children to Jesus to be blessed. Now the second scripture is also about the novice in the faith, the person that may not know Christ very well, even though they might be an adult. And Jesus warns those that have uh, a little bit further down the faith walk uh, to be cautious and to make sure that they don't cause them to sin because it would be better for them to tie a big stone around their neck, according to Jesus, and try to swim across the Lake of Galilee than to cause a new or a young one in the faith to sin. Now, the Reverend Tyler Hungate from Center Point United Methodist Church, who grew up in your church here and has been nurtured by you, is going to bring the word to you. So God bless you as you are saturated in the scripture today. So as Pastor Mike said, our first scripture today is from Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. It says, People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. We go back to Mark 9, verses 42 through 50, which reads, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eyes cause you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Will you please join me in prayer? Dear God, I thank you so much for bringing us here together this morning to experience your love and your grace, your forgiveness, your mercy, and your unending blessings that you shower us all with. I pray for the Holy Spirit to come into this place and into our hearts so we can hear what you want us to hear today, Lord. I pray for Tyler that the words he speaks may not be his own, but that they're yours, and that any anxiety or nerves can be calmed and comforted by you so he can shine your light into the lives of all listening. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. 
My name is Tyler Hungate. You'll notice that I uh, share a last name with that lady who just read the scripture this morning. I currently serve as the youth pastor at Centerpoint United Methodist Church alongside Andrew Happ, who is another product of this congregation and your faithfulness. I'm also a seminary student at Liberty University, uh, which is based out of Lynchburg, Virginia. I've been married to my wife, Bailey, for just over a year now, and we met at Summer Games. Uh, So to all of you who give to the campus, scholarship program. Thank you. Um, Because if you didn't, not only would I not be here this morning uh, before you, but I also wouldn't be married. So thank you. Um, This congregation is actually what you might call my my home church, right? I I came to Christ when I was about 15 years old, and this is the the church body uh, that nurtured me and that uh, led me from that point forward. And uh, in a lot of ways, this church body is still nurturing me, for which I'm very grateful. Um, I'm one of the individuals who has received, over the last couple of years, seminary scholarships uh, from this church to help me pay for my education as God continues to kind of take me along the, the path of vocational ministry. So I am very grateful uh, to be here with all of you this morning. Um, and for those of you who already know me and didn't need any of those introductions, what's up? Um <laughs> It's great to see all of you. It's good to be uh, with family this morning. And uh, as we dive into our text, into our passages for today, we're going to be talking a lot about family. And uh, we're going to be talking about how serious is Jesus is, dare I say deadly serious Jesus is, about uh, his children, about the people of God, and about not leading others astray. And also about what our heart is to be towards God, about how the position of our heart is uh, reflective of what it means to receive the kingdom of God. And so I want to start uh, illustrating this point with a little story about uh, what I think Jesus is getting at here in Mark's chapter 9 and 10. So when I was about three years old, and in the first service, of course, I said I was five years old, and then my mom, who was in the first service, came and corrected me. But So I was three years old, and we were at a, a wedding for some of our family friends and They did this wonderful thing. It was a beautiful day. It was sunny outside. And after the wedding reception, as the bride and groom were being sent off from the reception to go on their honeymoon, they did this thing, this beautiful tradition uh, that a lot of couples do where you blow bubbles, right? And they come out through the bubbles and the photographer gets great pictures. And so everybody's very excited, right? It's a wedding and people are kind of jostling each other around. And um, I was three, so I don't know this, but if I I could imagine that maybe there were some drinks to be had. And so people were kind of um, moving around a little bit and I as my three-year-old self was standing there I'm getting ready to blow the bubbles and I have my dad on one side and then some other people that I don't really know on the other side and um unbeknownst to me, the guy next to me had opened up his bubble soap and um, I was just kind of looking around, you know, little three-year-old me and I happened to look up and at the exact moment that I looked up, the man next to me who had opened his bubble soap, uh, his container went from this to this. And so as I'm looking up into the sky, I get hit straight in both of my eyes with bubble soap and I screamed. And I don't remember if the bride and groom were out yet, but I sure hope not. And so I screamed and I cried and I wailed. I didn't know what to do. I just remember it being so painful. And I remember my dad, and I'm not that old, but I'm old enough that back when I was a kid, dads were still more like, suck it up and less like, oh, it's fine, I'll take care of you. And so I remember as soon as I started crying, like you have to stop crying, you have to stop whining because dad's gonna be mad at you for crying. And I remember in that moment, just feeling so desperate. so helpless. I had no idea what to do. All I knew is that my eyes were on fire. And in that moment, my dad uh, scooped me up in his arms and he took me home. And I I still remember to this day as a three-year-old being kind of surprised or or, or at least a little bit taken aback by how gentle my dad was towards me, about how caring he was as he laid me down on my bed and he helped me in a gentle way clean the bubble soap out of my eyes and he put a cold rag on my face. And uh, I, I think back to that story about how much I needed the love and care of my parent in that moment. And I think that is the exact position of our heart or disposition that Jesus is calling us to here in Mark's chapters 9 and 10, that kind of um, reliance and need for God. So our, our first point for today, as we just dive right into our scripture, is that faith and dependence are necessary to enter the kingdom of God. And so if you have your Bibles in front of you, or if you just want to look at the screen, I'm going to go back back to Mark chapter 10 and reread that passage for this morning. 
People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. So our passages this morning from Mark 9 and 10, they're located during a season in Jesus's earthly ministry where he was coming to a close, where he was preparing to go to Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world. And he began to kind of narrow his focus of his teachings, specifically on his 12 disciples, almost as if he really wanted to make sure that there were certain things that his closest followers, the ones he knew would be the forefathers of the church, there are things that he wanted to make sure Sure that they got, right? Things that they understood before he was crucified. And that's not to say that any one teaching of Jesus is more or less important than another, simply that Jesus chose this specific time in his ministry when he was focused on preparing the 12 for what was to come. And so people are bringing children forward to Jesus to bless them, right? Not unlike we would take uh, little kids today to, to be kissed by or take pictures with, um, you know, people that are respectable or people that are famous or, or whatever. And the disciples, they start to turn away the these families. And this makes Jesus really mad, right? I think we like to sometimes only think of Jesus as this sweet, docile man who, um, you know, he healed the lame and the sick, right? And he's a shepherd. And yet it says Jesus was indignant, that he was incredibly angry at his disciples for turning <clears throat> the children away from him. And we see throughout Mark's gospel, and you've seen as you studied Mark Goss, Mark's gospel, that he goes to great lengths to highlight two specific characteristics of the apostles, right? One of them is that they're incredibly prideful, and the other one is that they want Jesus to themselves as much as possible. And so it's not odd that the disciples were shooing people away, trying to not let them draw near to him. And yet Jesus, he pushes away the disciples' hands and he scoops up the children into his arms and he blesses them. It's not clear exactly how old the children were because the word in Greek that Mark uses uh, in some places in the Bible is used to describe children as young as eight days old, and then in other places is used to describe uh, Jairus' daughter who is as old as 12. Um, so we don't know exactly how old these kids were, but it's likely that we're talking about young children, like really, really young, infant to maybe four or five years old, because it says that Jesus, one, he scoops them up in his arms, right? And it wouldn't, it wouldn't be very normal probably for him to be picking up a 13 year old. And also because the word in Greek that Luke uses when he tells this exact same story is a different word that specifically means babies. And so we're probably looking at Jesus most likely blessing babies or very young children. And so as 21st century, you know, Western Christians, we kind of get this picture in our minds. We think, how could the disciples turn away babies? Right? Like they're just these cute, sweet, little, innocent babies. Everybody loves them. There's no way that the disciples would be turning them away. How could they do that? And yet in their time and in their culture, babies were not valued in quite the same way as they are today. Like sure, parents still loved their children, but societally, children had zero social status and therefore they were without any redeeming value in the eyes of people living in antiquity. They didn't have that same place in their hearts for babies that we do. They simply saw them as little adults that couldn't yet provide for themselves or contribute anything to society. So they had very little to no redeeming social value. And this was so true, in fact, that it was not uncommon in antiquity for people to leave babies that they didn't want out in the wilderness to, to die at the hand of the elements, right? And so if children were born and they didn't look the way you wanted them to, if they were born with some kind of malformity, or even if they were just simply born as a girl, all of these reasons were enough for people in the Roman Empire to take babies and to just leave them in the wilderness overnight to, to be prey to the elements. And early Christians actually motivated by Jesus's treatment of children, specifically in this chapter of his life, they were known to venture out into the wilderness near cities and to listen for the cries of abandoned children to rescue them. All of this to say, 
that to the disciples and to the average person in Jesus' day, their actions would be justified because children would not be, in their eyes, worthy of the Messiah's attention. They were the lowly. They were of no social value. They were the ones that everybody looked down upon. And yet Jesus steps in, and instead of keeping the status quo, he does something that he does frequently throughout his ministry, and he actually flips the social order on its head. You'll sometimes hear this referred to as the upside down kingdom, that the the very people that the rest of society would outcast, the very people that the rest of society would look down upon, would not care about, would cast aside. Those were the exact people that Jesus said, I care about them. Those are the exact people that Jesus said, you'll be first in the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus, he steps into the expectations, the societal structures of his world, and he completely reverses them. He does this all the time, right? The woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, the foot washing, eating with tax collectors and sinners, just to name a few. It was normal. It was characteristic of Jesus to flip the kingdom upside down. And so what is Jesus's point? In saying that we have to receive the kingdom of God like a child, what does that mean? Well, here's what I think Jesus is not saying. He's not saying that in order to receive and enter into the kingdom of God, we must be innocent or pure or gentle. Because the fact of the matter is, we are none of those things. If that's what Jesus was saying, then I would be doomed. If the prerequisites to enter into the kingdom of heaven were to be pure and innocent, then none of us would be getting in. Because Romans 3 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It also says that no one is good, not even one. And so if innocence and purity are requirements for entering into his kingdom, then I'm not getting in because my sinful heart is naturally opposed to God and so is yours. So that's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is that in order to enter into the kingdom of God, I must become utterly dependent and reliant upon him for my assurance of salvation. That we are, as children of God, to have an openness, a need for Christ's atoning grace that is characteristic of a child that is utterly helpless for their own survival, if not for the intervention of a parent. The British theologian and Bishop Alfred Rawlinson puts it this way. The point of comparison that Jesus is making in Mark 10 is not so much the innocence and humility of children. For children are not invariably either innocent or humble. Spend any time around a two-year-old and you'll know that's true. It is rather the fact that children are unselfconscious receptive and content to be to be dependent on others care and bounty it is in such a spirit that the kingdom must be received it is a gift of god and not an achievement on the part of man it must simply be accepted in as much as it can never be deserved Here's why I think we like to get in the way of the gospel as adults, especially adults in the West, because we want to believe that everything we have, we've earned. You've been told your entire life that anything good that's coming to you is something that you go out and get yourself. And you know what? At Rockwell Collins, at Transamerica, at Agon, or wherever you work in the classroom, on the sports field, that's probably true. And listen, I'm right here to say, I was, I was there with you. I am there with you, right? My favorite saying growing up was, good things come to those who go out and get them, right? I said it so much that there was a Spanish teacher in our school who would write inspirational quotes from famous people on the board. And one day she wrote, good things come to those who go out and get them. And she quoted me with that phrase. Can you imagine like one day is Martin Luther King Jr. And the next day is some smelly, pimply 16-year-old who probably stole that off a coffee mug. And listen, I'm not saying don't work hard, right? That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying don't go get that promotion. But what I am saying is, and what I believe Jesus is saying here is don't let your heart become so hard that you start to believe that the kingdom of God is something that you have to earn because you can't because you're not innocent and you're not pure. And that's actually the goodness of the message of the gospel, that you could never be good enough to earn the kingdom of heaven, that you could never do enough things to work your way into the kingdom of God. And yet he calls you not to those things, but to utter reliance and dependence on him and him alone. That salvation can come to you in no other way than a free gift that you could never earn or deserve. It's the most freeing message that you or I or the world has ever seen especially for those of us who start to be in church for a long time, because we know this is true and then we start to forget about it. 
We start to think if I don't serve on enough committees, if I don't volunteer enough in the church, and those are good things, please don't stop doing them. But we start to tell ourselves that we have to do enough to earn the favor of God. And yet you and I could never be good enough to earn our way into the kingdom of heaven. And yet God loves us in all our brokenness and all our screwed up messness that he would actually, instead of calling us to work our way into the kingdom of God, he would say you should receive the kingdom of God. It's not a place that you're gonna go to. It's actually come to you in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, who became your sin so that you could become the goodness of God. That when, when God the Father looks at you, he no longer sees your sin and brokenness, but actually sees the righteousness of Jesus. That when Jesus died on the cross, he became your sin so that you might become the righteousness of God. That's not something you could earn. That's not something you could deserve. That's not something that you could work hard enough to get. And yet God gives freely because of his love, his mercy, and his grace. Jesus is not a CEO. He's not looking for the best salesman. He's not looking for the best engineer. He's not looking for those who uh, think themselves spiritually deserving or who believe that salvation is achievable if you can simply manage your moral balance sheet. Jesus is here for the sinners. He's here for the broken, the weary, the heavy laden. He's here for you and me. He's here for those who are at the end of their wits and know that they aren't enough. You know what I think adults are like? And I, I, I lump myself in here. I'm an adult, barely. They're earners. They're deservers. They're all be fine. Don't worry about it. I can handle it. Guess what? No, you can't. You can't handle the weight of your sin in comparison to a perfectly holy God. You can't handle it. You're not strong enough to be the author and perfecter of your life. You're not good enough to be responsible for your own soul, and you're not powerful enough to, end, to guarantee your entrance into God's kingdom, and yet he never asked you to be. That in his grace, he actually extended his kingdom towards you. He doesn't call you to come to him with all of your stuff together. He calls you, he calls you to come to him like a child, desperate, needy, with no other way than to simply rely on him. He has called you to come to him like a child, completely and utterly helpless, if not for him, as one who understands the truth of Isaiah 64, 6, that all of my attempts at righteousness are like filthy rags before the Lord. But what does God do when I bring him my filthy rags, when I try to measure up? He beckons me in, and as it says in Matthew chapter 11, as he says in Matthew chapter 11, come to me, all of you who are burdened and heavy laden, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says in Mark chapter two that it's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's those who, are know, who know that they are sick. And he's come not to call the righteousness, but those who know that they are sinners. When God is calling us to himself like children, he's putting on display the truth of Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mike Iaconelli in his book on childlike faith says this, Christianity is not about learning how to live within the lines. Christianity is about the joy of coloring. The grace of God is preposterous enough to accept as a beautiful coloring that anyone else would reject as ugly. That's me. That's you. The grace of God sees beyond the scribbling to the heart of the scribbler, a scribbler who is similar to the two thieves who hung on the crosses on either side of Jesus. One of the two asked Jesus to please accept his scribbled and sloppy life into the kingdom of God. And he did. Preposterous. Unheard of. Undeserved. Upside down by the standards of the world. And yet very good news for the rest of us scribblers. Are you ready and willing to accept that like a child... You can't be good enough for God, and yet he's not calling you to be. Are you ready to accept the message of the gospel, that he doesn't ask you to come to him as a finished product, that he died on Calvary despite your flaws, and he extends an invitation towards you and me each day to run into his loving arms like a child who, who has fallen off their bike, a child who is 
completely and utterly reliant on their parent for love? Are you ready to rely on him for salvation the same way you relied on your parents for sustainment and to gaze upon him with wonder and joy the same way you did as a child the first time you saw anything grand or beautiful? You have to forgive me, I've been sick the last week. As children of God, as those who have been called to receive the kingdom of God like children, faith and dependence are necessary to enter into his kingdom. But what else is determined for a child by their parent? It's their identity. Your identity and mine is determined by our status in Christ. In most cultures throughout history, you would be known within your region by who your family is. We still have surnames for that very reason. As a child, who you are is determined by whose you are. You'd be amazed at how many times in my life people have known who I was before I told them my name because I look just like my dad. Like if I had a dollar for every time someone said, you are a spitting image of your father, I would be a wealthy man. And as those who come to Jesus like a child, we are given a new identity in him. We are called his children. John 1.12 says, Yet to all those who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become the children of God. You see, the term Christian was originally an insult used to denote the followers of Jesus, the early disciples. And it was taken on by the early disciples as a title of honor. In Greek, it literally means those who belong to Christ. Those who belong to Christ. Other people have translated it as little Christs. Either way, the term Christian, the term that you and I wear if we are in Christ, identifies us as his. That Jesus has given us, those who belong to him, the right to be welcomed into his family. Now, maybe some of you were fortunate enough, like me, uh, to grow up with a good earthly father. But I know that that's not all of our stories. In fact, uh, even the good earthly parents I know and you know can't do everything to protect us from developing malformed identities. And so when I was a teenager, uh, some circumstances had befallen our family that led to me kind of wrapping up my identity and my ability to protect my younger siblings. And so then... I moved to college and I wasn't around my younger siblings anymore. I wasn't around uh, the same people that I had been around. I, I was in a new place at college, which is a big enough transition for people. But even more than that, even more than the newness of moving, of starting college, I didn't know who I was. Because so my whole identity had been wrapped up in, in being a protector for my family. I knew that my identity should be in Christ. I knew that my identity was in Christ, but I had become so set in the ways of my life that while I was in my freshman year of college, I would lie awake at night wondering if my family was okay. I was tormented by dreams of my, brothers and my brother and sister's tears. And because I wasn't there, because I wasn't the one comforting them or consoling them or protecting them, I believed that I no longer had any purpose or value. And I know that I'm not alone in this. I know that there are many of you that are children of God and yet you still look to the world to determine your circumstances and your identity. And I know that that's true because if I asked you to tell me about yourself, I know that you would start with, how many kids you have, where you went to school, what you do for a living, maybe your hobbies. We've allowed the process of becoming adults, even those who are young adults. We've allowed the process of becoming adults to this world to draw us away from the childlike faith that we're called to, one that identifies us first and foremost with our Heavenly Father. See, we live in a world that wants to identify us by our flaws, that wants to identify us by our failings and our shortcomings, our external characteristics and our social standings. But for those who have been adopted into sonship, for those who have drawn near to the Lord, not by our own power, not by our own goodness, but by the grace of God and who have been given the rights to be called His children for those of us, he has given us a new name. So here's what I have to say about identity. So, so look right at me, people of God. Look right at me. Stop letting the world tell you who you are because only Christ gets to do that. 
Stop letting the world determine your identity and your self-image because only God has that right and authority in your life. Christ gets to, to, to tell you who you are, not the world. The world says that you better pick yourself up by your bootstraps or you're never going to amount to anything, but God says that you are his handiwork, that you were created in him and you are the paramount of his entire creations. That's Ephesians 2.10. The world says that you're broken and condemned to your flaws, but God says that you are redeemed and made new. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The world says that you're worthless, that you don't matter, that if you stopped doing the things that you're doing, that no one would love you anymore, that no one would care about you, that you'd be forgotten and broken and lost. And yet God says you are precious in his sight, that you're honored, that he loves you so much that he would go to whatever length it took to get to you. That's Isaiah 43, 4. The world says that you're ugly, that you're broken, that you're misshapen, that you're not good enough. And God says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's Psalm 139. The world says that your sins, that your failings, that your brokenness will define you forever, that you'll never be able to escape them. And the God of the universe says that in his grace and his mercy, that he died for you, that he bled for you on a cross, that your sins will be as removed as far as the east is from the west. That's Psalm 103. So believe me when I say the world does not get to tell you who you are. Only God gets to do that. That's why in Ephesians 1, it says he chose us in him from before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. From before the beginning of what we know as time, he knew you'd be screwed up. And you know what? He still came anyways. He still adopted you as his child anyways. Why? Not because you have any redeeming social value, not because you're a manager, not because you're a boss, not because you volunteer at the church, because he wanted to glorify his name and he sought to do that through loving you. It says in Ephesians 1 that he did it simply out of his pleasure, by the power of his grace, even though you and I are unworthy, that he would adopt us before the creation of the world as his sons and daughters. The most freeing message that the world will ever see is that you're not good enough, and yet God doesn't call you to be. He calls you to come to him like a child. That's why it's so important to understand that the kingdom of God can't be earned because our identity doesn't come from our ability to deserve grace. It comes from the glorious God who said from before the creation of the world, yeah, I know what they're gonna say about you and heck, they're probably gonna be right most of the time. I know the things that the world is gonna label you with and they're probably gonna be right most of the time and yet it doesn't matter to me because I love you, not because of how good you are, but because of how glorious I am. And they, the world, don't get the final say about you. That's my duty and mine alone. And as God, I chose to call you mine. Nothing else. Christians, non-Christians, who or what are you letting define you? Who gets the final say in your life as to what your identity is? Come back to the heavenly father who called you his own. Not because you're perfect, because you're not but because he's loving, he's gracious, he's holy, and because Christ died in your place. And if you've, been, if you've put your faith in him, you've been given a new identity. That when the world calls you broken, when the world calls you damaged goods, when the world calls you unredeemable, when the world calls you the lowest of the low, when the world says that you will never change, it's in that moment that Christ steps right into all of that brokenness and all of that mess and all of that sin, and he gives you a new name. It's in that moment that Christ steps in and he calls you loved. He calls you forgiven. He calls you justified. He calls you glorified and sanctified and redeemed, not because you're worthy, but because he is a good father. And so as he calls us to himself in childlike faith, he also calls us as we interact with others, especially with other believers, he calls us to treat each other with that same level of forgiveness and grace that he has shown to us. So finally, this morning, as children of God, we must become students of our own character flaws. That's how the Bible scholar Tim Mackey puts it, that as children of God, we should become students of our own character flaws. I want to draw your attention back to Mark chapter 9, just the first part. 
This is 42 through 47. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Notice that Jesus takes the spiritual well-being of those around us very seriously. All of those who believe in him, he calls little ones, especially those who are young or immature in the faith. And he says it would be better to have one of these wrapped around your neck and try to swim across the Sea of Galilee. Hayden, you want to throw that picture up for me? It would be better to have one of these wrapped around your neck and have you be thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of your brothers or sisters in Christ to stumble. And look, Jesus knows that we're not perfect. I tell my church all the time, if I've never done anything to upset you, to, to make you mad, to displease you, just wait a little while. Right? It'll happen. Jesus knows that we're not perfect, but he's calling us to a radical kind of accountability and hospitality and forgiveness towards one another that is in direct contrast to what the world calls us to. In direct contact, contrast to my self-serving nature, just as the disciples demonstrated when they wanted Jesus all to themselves, he's calling us to a radical kind of self-discipline that's chiefly concerned with making sure that our actions are not spiritually harmful to others. Likely, there was probably one of these big stones sitting near Jesus as he was teaching. And he pointed at it. He uses it to make a point. He said it would be better to have that big stone that can only be moved on the other end by the power of a strong animal like an ox or a donkey than for you and have that tied around your neck and tossed into the ocean than for you to cause somebody else to sin. And so he's using this common rabbinical metaphor as he moves into the eye and the hand and the foot. He's not encouraging literal self-mutilation, though there have been Christians throughout history who have taken it uh, that way, that seriously. <clears throat> but rather, I believe Jesus is calling us to a radical level of accountability to our fellow children of God that ensures that we do as little damage to each other as possible. Let's be honest, right? You don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you know somebody who doesn't come to church anymore because they were hurt by people in the church, right? Heck, some of you probably been that person at one point or not in your life. Or maybe you were the person that was the reason someone else left, right? We know that those things happen, and yet Jesus is calling us to become students of our own character flaws, that we might succeed in being the body of Christ, that we might succeed in striving together alongside one another, bearing up under one another's burdens in kingdom work. And so he uses this metaphor, right, the eye, the hand, and the foot, and he's trying to represent the different areas of your life, right? In, in Jewish rabbinical times, the hand was representative of your actions, right? What you do and how you treat people. Your eye represented how you perceive things, how you see the world, how you perceive and act towards other people around you, and then your foot represented where you're going, right? What path your life is taking you on. Who are you becoming? And with all of these things, Jesus says it would be better to lose those things, it would be better to lose the thing that allows you to work. It would be better to lose the things that allow you to see and perceive. It would be better to lose the things that take you on the path that God has set before you than to cause somebody else to stumble, to fall into sin. He's saying that every area of your life and mine is to be marked by a radical selflessness, the very same one that marked his own life and ministry, especially in our treatment of one another. In light of his sacrifice, we are called to live sacrificially in such a way that we would go to any length, that we would do whatever it took to ensure the spiritual well-being of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what we are called to. We're not called to be like the world. We're not called to get what we deserve and to give other people what they deserve. Because you know what? If that's what Christ did, then you and I would be in a place a lot worse than the bottom of the ocean with a millstone tied around our neck. With that level of grace and forgiveness that Christ has shown us, we are called to love and care for our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, as we talk about childlike faith, Bailey and I, we don't have kids yet, but we, we hope to someday. But um, we do spend a lot of time around children just in the church and, and our friends that have young kids. And um, I'm always struck when I spend time around children, even ones that I like for any period of time, at just how needy they are. 
You know what I mean? Like the crying, the whining, the need for attention and love on top of all the other semi-important stuff like food and shelter. And I think to myself as I reflect on that picture of a crying baby, helpless, right? In the Roman Empire, abandoned in the woods, at the mercy of the elements. And I think to myself, that's exactly what I would be without Jesus. That in the eternal state of my soul and life, without Jesus, I would be like an infant, abandoned, hopeless, lost, doomed. For all the ways that we, as North American adults, try to make it seem like we have our life together, if I had to stand face to face with the sin and brokenness that permeates my life and the rest of the world, I'd be helpless. I'd be lost. And yet, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, that God didn't choose to, to leave us in that place, that Christ didn't consider equality with God something to cling to, that he could have stayed right there in heaven on his heavenly throne. And yet when he looked at me, when he saw that helpless, broken, lost soul abandoned to the elements of sin and death, he didn't consider equality with God something to cling to, to use to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so when Jesus Christ was on Calvary, when his arms were outstretched and his feet were overlapped with nails driven through his wrists and the middle of his feet, as he breathed his last breath, as he bore the weight of humanity's sin, of my sin and your sin, it wasn't the people who are convinced that they're perfect that he was doing it for. It wasn't the people who think that they're good enough to earn their way into heaven that he was thinking about. It wasn't those who think that they are saved because they are so awesome. No, the, the faces, the, the pictures that were on the mind of our Lord and Savior as he stepped to a cross that I deserved were the faces of the weak, the lowly, the burdened, the outcasted, the sinners. Those who are desperate to be brought back into the loving arms of a heavenly father. No, when Christ stood on Calvary, he wasn't thinking about them. He was thinking about his children. He was thinking about you. And he was thinking about me. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, Heavenly Father, we know that we could never be good enough. We know that we could never do enough to earn or deserve your love and grace. And yet, God, you lavish it upon us, as it says in Ephesians chapter 1. By the, by the graciousness of your name, God, that you have lavished grace upon us. And so, Lord, we step into that this morning. We walk into that desperate and needy and hopeless like children, God, those who are lowly without social value, God. We step into that place this morning. We accept that title, Lord, and we receive the kingdom of God as those who are in desperate need of a Savior. We know that you have poured yourself out for us freely and forever. And so God, I pray that those who don't know, those who haven't stepped into your free grace, those who haven't accepted your love and your mercy, God, I pray that this morning by a work of your Holy Spirit, that we would stop trying to be good enough to earn your favor, that we would stop thinking that we could ever be enough, God, and that we would just rest and trust in the fact that always and forever, Jesus is enough. Lord Jesus, you are enough. And we thank you for the mercy and grace that you have lavished upon us today. We pray these things together as your children in your holy and precious name. Amen.